Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Ralph Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecke. I'm Joy J. Moore. Hey, and this is the podcast for March 12th, 2023. Happy birthday in advance, Dr. Joy. 39 once again. <laughs> Getting a little experience on that. <laughs> and so, speaking of parties, we have the text is from Matthew 22, the story of the wedding banquet. Once again, we get the story of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, which is, in my imagination, where God's preferred future or God's will breaks into the now and God's will begins to be inhabited in earth. It's compared to a great wedding banquet where the king invites people, but not everybody comes. Hmm. And so he sends uh, sends out his servants to call those who have been invited, and the, they're not just uh, neglectful guests; they're really ungrateful wretches, right? They um, they n- make light of it, went away, one to his farm, another to his business. But here's the kicker: while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them, it seems like a a rather harsh response to a wedding invitation. Uh, so the king is um, understandably angry, so he uh, destroys the murderers. And then, uh, this is my favorite part of the parable, he says, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. So uh, this invitation is for everyone, uh, both good and bad, uh, the text says, uh, and they come in to, uh, to, the, to the royal wedding banquet, uh, which the king is throwing for his son. Let's stop there for let's let's yes. do the first part, sure, and then we'll get to the really the weird difficult part. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's bad enough. It's bad, <laughs> yeah. Already, it's a weird enough story already. Yes, but let's just go this far. You were, uh, uh, Joe. You're about to get in. No, uh, I'm I I'm gonna point to the the uh, the commentary. So let's let's take it in bite size, because once again. Uh, 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 Kimberly Wagner is giving me an uh, allegorical reading that I had not attended to before that I just think is really powerful. And I encourage our listeners to, to take a look at, at, uh, at the commentary for this week. Well, what, what in particular, you said well, taking an order. So, uh, oh, which I'm yeah, no, I thought, I thought we were going to set up the, set up the beginning, but um, uh, she, she, t- she takes note of, 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 of getting to how this is a difficult read, and so what we're what we're looking at here allegorically um, would be that uh, the first set of slaves represents the prophets, the in, and the oh. Israelites would be the invited guests to the banquet, and then the violence is done to them, which represents Israel's rejection, and then she goes on to say that uh, the second set of slaves extends it. Um, and they represent uh, the uh, Christian prophetic missionaries. And then finally, the guests uh, are rejected um, uh, for, not, for not putting on the right garments, which she describes as, as the Christian life. And in our weeks uh, uh, ahead, at, uh, or previously, where we've been talking about Lenten practices or alluding to Lenten practices, what does it mean for us to practice the life of forgiveness that is reflective of the character of God? What does it mean for us to practice the generosity that bears the image of a generous, merciful God? And, and that that becomes what is, is the reason for, for you know, not uh, being received and for such a judgmental response. So I have one question before I give my own different sort of read on the early part of the parable. Okay. How do you make that read without it being anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish? See, I don't read that. I'm going to use a line from, um, from uh, um, 
Mel Gibson, when Mel Gibson uh, did The Passion uh, of Christ and um, they were asked, um, why was Jesus killed by the Jews? And Gibson said, because he wasn't Italian. And the point he was making was that Jesus was a Jew in a Jewish neighborhood um, and he bothered the people in his community and they took him out. And if he'd been Italian, then he would have bothered the Italians and the Italians would have taken him out. And, and I think a way for us to pay attention to this is what God has done in Genesis 12 is to make a promise for all the world. Um, the promise that, uh, Rolf, you keep saying that the kingdom is the end of God's preferred uh, reality uh, into our our world right now. And, and God's creation was ideally this preferred reality and humanity rejected it. And so for the sake of all the nations, God blessed one nation, but they were just like everybody else. They made the same rejection. They made the same mistakes. Everything that was done in what I call the prologue uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is magnified when we zero in on the people uh, that we know as Israel. Their behavior as humans is identical to everybody else. And so an anti-Semitic read makes them uh, as if they aren't doing what everybody else does. And, and I, I think they're doing what everybody else does. So uh, please, thank you for calling out on that. Um, but yes, yeah, please don't I would have, against the Jews. I know you. I know you're not anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic, and I know so that. But I wanted to ask you because you're exactly it. right. The, uh, the this is a condemnation of all humanity. Here's the the thing that I want to highlight about the first part of the story: the king is having a wedding banquet for his son. If you were invited to the wedding banquet for the king's son. You would go. Yes. In fact, you had to go. Uh, I've, I'm, re I'm rereading with my dad a series of 20 novels on the Royal Navy, the British Royal Navy in the Napoleonic era by Patrick O'Brien. And I only say that uh, to set up that on the ship, if the captain invited people or if then in port, if the admiral invited the captain, you had to go to dinner. You were not allowed not to go, whether you were sick, whether you had something else you needed to do. And that's what this is. I mean, so when the king invites you, and of course he's inviting uh, the other nobility, who would be invited to the king's wedding? It's the other nobility, the landowners, the people with power. You did not dare not go. Right. And they didn't go. That's the offense that when God invites us into God's kingdom and we don't go. And so what does God do? Then God invites all those people. Mm. And of course, that's us also. Mm -hmm. That is, um, I didn't get invited to any um, inauguration balls. I didn't get invited to uh, Prince, any of the prince's weddings in Britain. And uh, But maybe I would be on the, okay, go into the alleys and find the worthless people because yeah. the important people didn't come. Maybe. Now I'm invited to the party. That's... I love this story so far. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but and just what, because what, Matthew is going to make sure we understand that all of us are guilty. Yeah, yeah. We got the ending and I'll introduce it like this and then you guys can solve it. Uh, I've never been uh, I've never been known anywhere in my life as a good dresser. When I, I used to teach at a college level and then I was called in 2003 to, to come teach at Luther Seminary. One of my college friends named Julie at the time said to me, you're going to teach at the seminary now. Does this mean you're going to dress even worse? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> so fix the ending. A man not wearing a wedding robe. It, I, I don't know what to make of it. I do like, as you said, Joy, I like that, the commentary um, on this for this week that 
especially if we read this parable in light of the others uh, that we've been talking about in the previous weeks, that, you know, the wedding robe is is the, the Christian life in the sense of, um, you know, forgiving, uh, um, not envying uh, um, those our brothers and sisters, uh, reconciling with our brothers and sisters, um, giving thanks for God's generosity and trying to live in that same generous way, not to make this into works righteousness, but to say, if you don't get that, if you don't inhabit that, if you don't um, understand those upside down ethics of the kingdom of heaven, then... uh, you're not going to you're not going to have a place at the wedding banquet. You're you're not even going to understand uh, the significance of the wedding banquet. I I don't know what else to to do with this, but I like that I like that interpretation. As a Lutheran, right? I I uh, I want to say that we are clothed with uh, the righteousness of Christ, right? So when we are baptized. Often, or when we baptize children, we often dress them in white. So my my three children uh, were all baptized in these beautiful handmade baptismal gowns uh, that my sister made, each of them. And they're going to be family heirlooms, hopefully, that they pass down to their children. Even my son, right, had the long baptismal gown, <laughs> right, the dress, Um that symbolizes, it's not just a sentimental kind of family heirloom thing, but it symbolizes the righteousness of Christ that clothes us where God claims us in baptism and says, this is my beloved child, this is my beloved son or daughter uh, clothed in, uh, in the righteousness of Christ. And we see that same symbolism, of course, um, maybe not as much these days, but uh, um, in in. Uh, in a funeral with a funeral pall, right? The the white cloth that is draped over the coffin, again, to symbolize that this is a sheep of God's own redeeming, a lamb of God's own redeeming. So that's where I go when I hear a wedding right. robe. I like it. The Lutheran solved the problem of legalism <laughs> with an appeal to baptism. What does the Methodist do in closing? <laughs> oh, the Wesleyan is going to say uh, that last line, which is so hard for many are called, but few are chosen. And in this sense that um, the invitation is given out to everyone, but we sometimes say no. And it, it, it comes back full circle. It's not, if we if we read it in our response to God's grace, which All of the previous weeks, we've been talking about that. What is the response to this generosity, this mercy, this grace, this forgiveness? If we read it in terms of what is our response to God's grace, rather than being angry with God for saying, you know, there is just some oppression. There is just some hatred. There is just some uh, injustice that God will not stand for. And, and when we put it like that, God's character continues to be merciful. And the question is whether or not we are willing to surrender to God's will and to bear God's image in the world.